So if you want to make progress as a portrait artist, what is the one thing that you literally 100% cannot do without? In fact, it's a really simple thing and we all already know the answer. It's making lots of studies of the head. In this video, I'm going to show you how an app that I developed called the Head Study app can help you make that accountable progress on your way to being a badass portrait artist. Now, one of the first challenges you face when you're trying to make a lot of head studies in a short amount of time is that you need to collect a lot of source images. And ideally, these source images would be of the head from a variety of different angles in a lot of different lighting situations. This is because the process of drawing these heads from all these different directions in all these different lighting situations is how you build up a mental library of the forms and structures of the head that you will draw upon and benefit from for the entirety of the rest of your career. So this essentially is exactly what I developed the Head Study app for. When you open up the app, the first thing that you're gonna see is that you have a variety of different heads that you can choose between. We have at first a human skull, then we have a super simplified block in whose key points correlate to specific anatomical points on the skull. Then we move to a slightly more complex planes of the head model, which in itself is a simplification of the kinds of naturalistic heads that we're attempting to draw in our fully rendered portraits. Finally, after that, we have an écorché model. So what we're talking about here is a model that doesn't have any skin on it. And also in this case, not any of the fatty deposits that we also find in the face. Eventually, all four of these models seen together in the same lighting situation and in the same orientation can offer you a much deeper insight into the fundamental structure and composition of the human head in a way that is highly beneficial for a drawing student. Now, what I'm gonna be using the app for today is to generate a couple of source images so that I can do a couple of head studies in my sketchbook so you can get a sense of one of the primary use cases for this app. I think today I want to do one drawing of a skull and I also want to do one drawing of a slightly more complex planar head. I haven't decided yet whether I'm going to do the two drawings in the same pose and in the same lighting. So I'm just going to start by playing around with these models and making a cool lighting situation that I think would be fun to draw. One of the principal features of the app is that you can adjust the location and also the intensity of the light. And that is true for both light sources. So if I want the secondary light source to be really, really intense, I can turn it all the way up to the top. Or if I want it to be really, really dim and subdued, I can turn it down to a much lower setting. I think for this drawing, I'm going to keep that secondary light source at a minimum because I want like a decent, solid kind of academic lighting atmosphere for this study. And as a bonus, I can also adjust the color of both of the light sources. In this case, it's not really gonna make that much of an impact because I'm just drawing it in graphite. But if I want the image to look cooler or warmer, I can easily make that change. In this case, maybe we'll go for a super cold secondary light source somewhere in the kind of blue, blue-violet range and adjust that so it's more like a kind of a rim lighting that will reveal some of the structure inside the shadows. Something else that's important, of course, is that I can adjust the background color and value. In this case, I want a background that's darker than the shadows on the right-hand side of the subject. So it reveals not only the form on the shadow side, but also allows the ambient or rim lighting to be revealed in contrast. In fact, as I look at this pose right now, I think it's actually really, really cool. I wanna make maybe one adjustment to the location of the first light source. I think I'd like to see a little bit more of that eyelid. That I think is actually a pretty cool perspective to draw from. I'm gonna do a screen grab of this pose and maybe this will be the one that I draw. Let's see what the skull looks like in this lighting situation. Yeah, at this particular turn, I don't think I see enough of the skull on the right hand side. So maybe I'm gonna alter the pose a little bit. Oh, that's actually really cool, isn't it? Really nice shadow and light shape. But let's adjust the light source in the direction a little bit. Maybe you can do like an underlit skull. Ooh, that's really, really cool. Yeah, I like that a lot better. I think we're gonna do like a totally different light source for this second study. By the way, pausing here for a second, this is one of the absolutely coolest things about this app. You can literally light your subjects from any direction that you want to in 360 degrees. Which, by the way, if you've drawn from life a lot, which I have, it becomes actually incredibly difficult to light your subjects from so many different varieties of angles if you have a kind of small studio space. Anyway, one more reason why I think this app is really cool. So I'm gonna screen grab this pose. And I think I have now the two source images that I want to use to make drawings today. Now, 
now it's possible when you do these drawings to make like really highly detailed studies and take a really long time to do it and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I'll say that for me I think there's a lot of progress that can be made by going through a series of very fast drawings. So what I'm going to do here is try to show you the simplest version of a study that you can make from this app so that you can get the greatest possible benefit from the time that you're spending with it. Well, it seems like we're making a portrait drawing just like any other. In fact, I want to mention that all of the models in this app went through a very extensive design process. In fact, I'm almost ashamed to say how extensive the design process was. So many different drafts were taken, especially for the more complex planar head model that I'm drawing right now. Maybe it's worth explaining why the design of these models was so carefully considered. The reason can be explained in a really simple way. If every artist and every teacher out there in the world working today were to make their own simplified planes of the head model, each and every one would be totally different. So all of the plane shifts and simplifications that you see in this head are representative of my vision for the most efficient way we can understand the critical volumes of the head. So whether or not you've been following along with my teaching on Patreon, this will give you incredible insight into what I think is most important in terms of form and structure with respect to portraiture. Now, in one use case, you could say that it would be really interesting to just make a linear study of the head. I think I'm going to integrate the shadow and light as well because I think it's one of the things that makes this pose particularly cool. So I'm going to use some indications of the plane shifts to guide me around for the sake of accuracy and proportion. But eventually I'll probably hide a lot of them inside shadow as well. Overall, this particular model took me over a year to develop. And I can say for sure that going in, I did not think that was going to be the case. I thought that you just cut off a few planes, you simplify head a little bit, and then all of a sudden you have a pretty reasonable three-dimensional configuration that is going to be applicable across a lot of different use cases. Eventually, I did not find that to be true. Even things that I thought would be simple, like how to show the planes of the zygomatic bone, became a very complicated conflict between simplicity and clarity. How much can you simplify something before it stops looking like the thing that it's supposed to represent? Anyway, I know that on one level this isn't going to be interesting for everybody using the app, but for sure, my experience was a really intense one, and I can't help but want to tell you the story of it. Another really underrated thing that I wanted this app to do was actually just to have models that I thought were really beautiful, were really attractive, and that I thought that they would be fun to draw because not only are they informative, but they just on a very basic level look cool. You know, so much of the academic process of learning has this kind of dry affectation, meaning that if it's like really good for us, like eating our vegetables, it's got to kind of taste bad. I didn't want that to be the case. Uh, I wanted, in fact, to make the whole process of learning a little bit more streamlined and a little bit more fun. So hopefully that translates in the way that you all out there experience these models. Another question that the existence of this app kind of answers is why I draw so much using straight lines. It's something I recommend to all my students. I talk about it in YouTube videos. Everywhere where I'm drawing, I'm talking about using straight lines and using angle breaks. The genesis of this practice is actually within the simplification of a subject. When you take a rounded organic form and simplify it into flat planes, inevitably those flat planes are best represented by straight lines and where those planes meet, we have quite clear angle breaks. So the language of straight lines is actually the language of simplification, which you'll see represented really clearly in this model and also the other super simplified head lock-in model as well. I'm going to go through some of these plane breaks that are in the top of the head with my 3H pencil because I want to show them, but I don't necessarily want to break up the impression of light overall. So in here, in these areas, I'm going to use like a B or an HB pencil, and in these areas, I'll use like a 3H, just so I can show things like the detail of the temporal line here, and also to show really important features like the plane of the zygomatic arch and this plane break here at the side of the eye socket, which is indicating the widest point of the face. All these things I think are like really, really important. So I don't want to let the lightness of the value here hide the intricacy of some of this form. Obviously, each person can do that to whatever extent they think is interesting or, or useful. Like I said at the beginning, I think that there's a pretty valid argument for just making an entire line drawing study of this, uh, of this planes of the head. So you can really get a feeling for all of the intricacy that went into the design of it and all of what I like to think of as pretty clever simplifications that we came up with. 
All right, so what about some of that reflected light? I think rather than lightening up any areas inside the shadow, I'm going to go ahead and darken down the ones that aren't affected by the secondary light source. So I can get a nice sense of two different light sources hitting this model. By the way, before I do that, I need to shore up some of my shapes here and make sure they're solid enough to take the value I'm going to apply to them. So just the underside of the eye socket here. So this plane at the top is actually the one that's receiving a little bit of that secondary light and a little bit the bottom edge of the superciliary arch. Maybe I'll use my eraser a little bit. But also we have this interesting feature that is the upward facing plane of the upper eyelid that actually receives none of that secondary light and so becomes a pretty dark value as well. So in this case, since the secondary light was coming from below, any of the planes inside the shadow that are facing downward are going to catch that secondary light source. And anything in the shadow facing upward is going to be quite a bit darker. So it creates this really cool challenge of trying to figure out what the form inside the shadow exactly is and how we can show a beautiful, simple version of it in a way that looks, you know, kind of sort of convincing. Okay, I couldn't resist the urge to put in a little bit of halftone through here. It just seems so fitting as there's a strong directionality to the light coming from behind the model. I just got a little bit carried away and a little bit excited about showing that. I've probably taken this study much further than it actually needed to go. But just for the sake of this exercise, you can draw as many values as you want or as few values as you want. The idea is that you engage with the design of the head from a lot of different angles. Uh, in this case, we have a strong turned away three quarter uh, with a really beautiful set of shadow shapes that run down that three quarter edge. And as a follow up to this, what I think would be really cool is to take that same pose, move both lights around and keep studying the planes from this direction and allowing them to show the diversity of their expression as the light migrates and changes. That's all for this study now. I wanna move on to the second study I'm gonna do on this page. And that's the image of the skull that I showed you earlier in the video. Now I'm going to use pretty much the same proportions as we have on this planes of the head model here because I want them both to fit on the page in a way that seems correlated to one another. I don't think that I mentioned it starting out, but in my opinion, if you're trying to reach that 100 head mark, which if you're a student probably should be an objective of yours, you should figure that heads like this will take you maybe 25 to 30 minutes. I think a big challenge that people face when they're trying to hit that target though is that they look at what has happened in 25 minutes and they think, well, that's not a good enough drawing. And so they spend another 25 minutes and another one and another one and pretty soon you've been drawing for three hours and you're totally exhausted and your drawing actually isn't that much better than it was before. I think a better way to make progress rather than increasing the amount of time that you spend on your studies is to keep the time perfectly consistent and simply make more drawings with the time that you have available. There's a lot of different ways to explain this and a lot of wonderful analogies about ceramics courses and photography. But the bottom line is this, progress almost always correlates better to repetition than it does to a single long form project. And while I wanna refrain from giving you the hard sell about this app, having thousands of different iterations of position and lighting situation makes the process of making a lot of drawings way easier. I'm gonna keep my initial block in pretty loose and sketchy because I know that eventually I'm gonna make this a drawing that's about shadow and light. So my lines are really things that I'm gonna be mostly taking out of the drawing as time goes on. No need to make them particularly detailed in that case. Just wanna make sure I get the proportions right, I get the construction right, so that the framework that I eventually add shadow and light to is a very sound one. By the way, in no way, shape, or form are we gonna be drawing teeth in this study. If you give yourself 25 minutes to make a drawing, I promise you the first thing to go out the window is gonna be the teeth on the skull in your subject. Okay, we're gonna make it in time. This drawing has to immediately start to become about shadow and light. So I'm gonna dive into these shadow shapes quickly and as simply as possible. And the cool thing about adding shadow and light is that the shadow line itself is gonna reveal a lot of things about the planes and forms that the shadow line passes over. I was sketching out here some indications of the superciliary arch, the brow ridge. You can see how that shadow edge just flows right over the top of it. And of course, as we get out here to the kind of roundness at the top of the cranium, that shadow edge gets softer and softer. I'm gonna try and communicate that by Kind of breaking up that edge. That seems a good enough start to get my stump out. I'm just going to use my stump, which is quite saturated with graphite, to kind of fill in a value within all the shadows. Now I can go back in and try and make some of these shapes a little bit more specific. A bit of rim light at the uh, at the edge of the anterior nasal cavity. There we get this kind of 
pokes out of the shadow here. All these wonderful oddities that you come across when you have truly variable lighting situations. This is why you draw from so many different positions and with so many different lighting situations because the light will reveal to you things that other lighting positions won't do. I mean we're so used to our portraits being lit from the upper right hand side, kind of three-quarter angle, that all of our knowledge about the skull almost becomes tied together or uh, sort of merged together with that lighting situation. So you want to talk about getting outside of your comfort zone. It's really what we're talking about here. Get out of your comfort zone, draw the skull from different positions than you've experienced before. I promise it will only be a benefit to you. Now, a quick pro tip for everybody out there that's drawing their own skulls or drawing their own planes of the head. Create variation in your shadow edges. You should have sharp shadow edges. You should have very soft shadow edges that are very transitional in nature and keep going over them. Every time you advance the value, go through and redraw the design of your shadow edges. The benefit that this adds really is that it allows you to go over your drawing several times in search for accuracy. I mean, I believe in a really good, really great block in, but I also believe a lot more in revision than I do in being correct the first time. Once again, I'm gonna to switch to my 3H pencil for some of the kind of structural detail. Like here drawing the external orbital apophysis, that posterior edge, the lateral side of the orbital cavity. Just wanna make sure I can show these things without um, going too much into really kind of dark values. I don't wanna get into like a value statement drawing where it's gonna take me a lot longer to make the drawing than the time that I necessarily have. Which of course I've just set arbitrarily at 25 minutes. You can take as long as you want on your head studies. I just think for all of us out there working in a world that's competing a lot for our time and our attention and focus, that 25 minutes is like the, the reasonable barrier that we can set. I don't think there's too many people out there who truly can't conjure up 25 minutes to make a drawing. So to be totally fair to anybody who's following along with this video and drawing their own skull, I did go over the 25 minutes that I initially set out to do this drawing in. But hey, there were some cool shapes and I really got into it. Suffice to say though, if you're enjoying the drawing that you're making, there's no reason that you arbitrarily have to stop because you set out a target of doing a 25 minute drawing. In fact, the only reason that time limit is there is to give you an accountable target so that you can remember that making more head studies is gonna be more beneficial to your progress than making one and spending all the time that you have on it. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you think this app is pretty cool and you want to get a hold of it yourself, it's available in the App Store and on Google Play. To find it, just search for the words Head Study, and it should be the first thing that comes up. Anyway, that's all for now. I'm Stephen Bauman. If you like the content on this channel, please remember to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.